Hi. Hey, Miriam. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing great. I just got off another call. So sorry, I'm a little <laughs> behind. No. I like to be a little bit early. Um, how do I say, okay, so it's Miriam uh, Maika Day. Is that correct? It is not correct. It is pronounced, it's okay. It's pronounced Miriam Micah Day. Miriam Micah Day. Okay, yes. great. Sorry, I like to ask every time. I appreciate that. No, thank you for asking. How you doing? Right. I'm doing great. Um, I just got off another call. So I know we do have a lot of people coming in. So we are actually going to start right away. So I'm going to start letting people in here. Cool. I'm going to grab some water and be right back. Sure. Hey, everybody, we are going to get started very shortly. All right. All right. So we are going to get started. Um, I'm sure we're going to have some people still filing in, um, but welcome everyone to Big Apple Film Festival's mentor and networking session. Uh, today we have Miriam Micah Day. Did I get that right? You did. Good job. Okay. <laughs> All right. And she's going to be talking about screenwriting. Um, I just want to let everybody know. So I'm, in a moment, I am going to hand it over, um, but this is generally, these are generally Q&A based. Um, so if you look on the bottom of your screen, um, there's a little icon with a smiley face that says reactions. If you click on that on the bottom, there's the raised hand icon. Uh, if you have a question, if you could click on that, it'll make it very easy for us to go down the list and see uh, everyone's name in order so we can get to everybody as quickly as possible. Uh, there's also a bunch of other icons on the top bar. Please do not hit those buttons because they do very funky things, uh, which can be a little distracting. Um, so uh, I think that's all I have for now. Um, so uh, Miriam, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm in LA, so this is morning time for me. Um, I'm so glad you guys came in and jumped in on this particular Zoom about screenwriting. I think um, it'll be most helpful if I kind of give you guys a short lecture and then we can jump into the Q&A. So as you guys know, I am a screenwriter. Um, I work primarily in the studio network. I am what's called a writer for hire. So Studios will contact me, studio executives, heads, and say, hey, we're looking for a particular genre of film or a specific type of film, or they have a mandate that they want to fulfill, and then I will come in and pitch. And one of the things that really attracts these particular executives to me specifically, or any other writer for that matter, is what really identifies me as a particular thing. So I'm a BIPOC woman who writes something very specific. And that is the thing that I wanna to talk to you guys about today is the specificity of, of who you are as a writer. And when you get down to the specifics of who you are as a writer, that translates to making or writing screenplays that really stand out. So I am a writer who writes films about women overcoming insurmountable odds. Every film that I've ever written, every screenplay, TV, a teleplay, anything that I've written is always an undertone of a woman who is overcoming something. And the reason why that is who I am or what my brand is, as cliche as that may sound, is I bring something of myself to everything that I write. So each antagonist that I'm developing in a story is bringing a little bit of my own personal journey to the screenplay because you you know that old adage, write what you know. So I'm writing things about what I know specifically that will translate onto the page. And that in turn brings people to me to tell their stories for them because they know exactly what I'm delivering and giving to them. When I first got into the business, one of the, my first representation, um, excuse me, one of my first managers asked me, well, what do you write? 
what, what kind of writer are you? And I was like, oh, I do. I can do screenplays. I can do teleplays. I can write pilots. And that was not what he was asking. And that probably was not the best answer. When you drill down to who you are in terms of specificity and what you do, that will translate to great work that you put on the page. And so I want to just make sure that you guys understand that the brand that you're building really is important in writing the a screenplay that really makes sense. Another thing to think about in terms of your standout screenplay is why are you writing it? And why now? Why the story? Why are you the person to tell the story? And why is this story so should happen right now? And getting clear about those whys will help you to really structure and understand and examine the importance of the story itself, why you need to tell that story, because it brings in and it will imbue your passion about this particular idea and or screenplay that you want to either sell or you're being paid to write. And then the zeitgeist, like is are there other stories that are happening right now that are telling the same idea that you're trying to tell? Are you hitting on something that is happening current in like current events, things that you're seeing on the news? Like what is the thing that you're trying to tell rippling? And if it ripples in common culture, what you're seeing through today, does all of that make sense so far? Great. So now we're digging into, okay, the whys, and then you talk about your antagonist, right? So your antagonist is the person who was driving the story, and your antagonist is the person who was going to have that hero's journey. But the antagonist has to find some kind of conflict along the way. So what is the conflict that really gives you the engine that's going to drive your screenplay so that someone will want to turn from page one to page 15, from page 15 to page 30? What is that conflict and why is that conflict important? It's important because number one, we need to be able to be interested in the story. The conflict also informs the plot. The plot will actually drive the story to get us to the culmination or the kind of ending that you want to see. So the conflict that an antagonist goes through is the thing that really makes the screenplay sing. And so we need to think about what is that conflict and how does that conflict inform the plot? And your plot is essentially the story. What is the story about? What are we really trying to say? And the story drives directly to the heart of the character, which pulls on the heartstrings of your reader or your viewer. So those are the main points that we should talk about in terms of what is the story? Why are you telling the story? And why it's important to tell the story? And does it inform your brand or who you are as a writer? Let's talk about some questions. All right, so I just wanna remind everybody, if you do have a question, um, again, the reactions icon, there's a hand raise icon um, and I will uh, bring you guys up. Uh, just to get us started, I know that you had, you made a comment about when you are selling yourself and pitching yourself to agents, managers, I'm sure this also goes for executives when you're speaking to them about your brand. Um, and I'm sure it depends on who specifically you're speaking to, but do you think it's better that you put um, when they say, what do you write? Do you usually put that context in thematically what you are writing? Um, or do you put that in the context of genre more often? Great question. So first, before we even get to what do I write, I always ask the executive, what are you looking for? You want to solve their problem, right? You want to understand what is it that they have on their slate that they have a hole in and how you can figure out how do I fit that hole? Am I the right person for that job? All of those kinds of things. And then you go through your kind of repertoire or whatever you have ready to go that you can offer up as a solution to that problem. That's the first thing before I start talking about what I do. Then I say, hey, this is who I am. You've seen my samples. Typically, executives would have read you before they actually take a meeting or a general with you. So they will have your samples. Your samples will be an example of what you do, what, you, what your best writing sample or example of your work you have at that moment. And that genre will typically be what you're kind of auditioning or interviewing for. So that speaks for itself before you even have a meeting with them. So my particular genre, the things that I write are thriller, are dra dramas, and drama-based um, 
screenplays that are driven by female antagonists. So they will always see something like that. So for example, I have written biopics. If this particular studio is looking for the, you know, uh, Aretha Franklin's biopic, next writer or whatever, I would have sent that biopic to them. So you're trying to fit whatever that hole is that they're looking for. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions? Um, I saw someone had hit uh one of the reactions i think i'm not sure if that was an accident or they meant to hit the raise hand emoji or not okay i'll i'll ask another question until you know we have some more stuff coming through um, okay. is it any different when you are pitching for film or for or television like I don't know if your background is in television, um, but I'm just curious, like if there would be significant differences uh, depending on who you're speaking to. And what regard. Great question. Great question. Yes. I think that overall pitching for television and film are very different beasts. They're very different mediums, very different ways to go about it. So in my experiences, I'm usually a writer for hire where I'm a sole single writer who is pitching for say a TV movie or a feature film opportunity. And when I'm doing that, typically what happens is they will give me say, hey, there's a film that we want to produce. Here are the parameters that we want that film to be written in. What is your take on that particular thing? And so what I do is I will take that information, go back, write what I think this story should be. So you would actually write beat by beat what that is. So from act one, depends on what type of TV movie or film it would be. So you can do it in the nine act structure, five act structure, three act structure. So you would write the film essentially in a broad sense from point A to B. And then you talk about what it is that you think this film is. And then you take that back to the studio execs and you pitch them. The thing about pitching that has changed since COVID is that most pitches do not happen in person anymore. There was a time where you would go to the studio right over here to the WB or Sony right here with, you know, since I'm in Los Angeles, but we don't do that anymore. You pitch on Zoom. And so very similar to this situation here, you got to get in and out. It's very hard to hold someone's attention when you're not in their presence and trying to pitch an idea on Zoom. So even though you have the whole film from start to finish, maybe in front of you, maybe you sent it ahead as an email, you still have to hit all the high notes before you lose them 10 minutes or seven minutes into your pitch, right? So that's the key. That's the strategy that most people don't talk about is that you got to get in and out, TV and film. That's for both TV and film. For television, I think there's some slight nuance differences in that television is a very different world. You're selling the world. You're selling the characters, but you're also selling why people are going to tune in week after week, which is not the same thing as a film, because a film, as you know, is a one and done type of thing. So with that type of pitching, you have to have a the long game approach to what this particular um, enterprise is, if you will. So if I'm creating a world, why do I want to come into that world? And that world has to give me an inside view of something that I did not know before. If you look at all the television shows that you like, I'll give some examples. The Sopranos, um, Game of Thrones. All of those are really conflict-driven stories about characters who are having interpersonal relationships. But the world is something that you never known or have any personal experience in. Sopranos is a mob boss who has a family and he wants to do right by his family, but he's a mob boss. So he's in direct conflict with his personal life and his work life in a world most people are not living in a mob or living in a mob family or running a mob, for example. Game of Thrones, same thing. Family story driven by greed and power in a world that's medieval. Is it in a future? Is it in a past? You don't know. So these kinds of things, when you're thinking about television, is those keys that people need to kind of unlock the world. Why is this world different? Why do I want to come into this world week by week? And can I identify my own self, my personal self inside of these characters? And so kind of bringing it back to 
what this session is about making a standout screenplay, you have to check those boxes. Is the world interesting? Will people want to see my character overcome obstacles in this world? And if they do want to come back week by week, what am I seeing every week? What are they going to try to overcome each week? I hope that makes some sense. So let me dovetail a little bit into conflict, which is something that kind of piggybacks off of what we just talked about. You know, your antagonist is the hero of your story, whether you're writing television and or film, right? So the antagonist is going to go through something. And because he's going to go through something in the beginning of the story, he is going to take action to either fight against it, go with it, or find some sort of resolution. And that action will beget conflict, right? So in doing this kind of conflict idea, it's either going to be this character versus himself. So there's some sort of inner conflict. There's going to be this character versus someone else. So it's an interpersonal conflict, like we were just saying about Game of Thrones and The Sopranos. Then there's this hero versus the world, like an extra personal conflict. So that could be like uh, Tom Cruise and uh, what's that film? I forget the title, but when he has to face aliens, like there's a world that's happening and the world is going to come apart. And then it's God versus nature, something like a Jurassic Park. So those kinds of things are the keys to creating or at least understanding what types of conflicts you're going to try to build in your stories. Let me know if that makes sense if I'm, and if I'm giving you guys too much. So obviously something like, you know, Jurassic Park, um, Star Wars, stories like that, where you have this very clear cut external conflict of what a character wants, what a character needs. Um, those are generally people can understand that much more or easily, I should say. What do you think uh, when you were talking about the more of the conflict may be more internal. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have a lot of stories that are coming out now about people in their 20s and maybe their 30s where they don't necessarily, they know they need something or want, the character may know they need something or know they want something, but they don't know what that thing is. How, mm -hmm. how do you think that you would go about writing uh, a story like that? A great example of that is Girls on HBO, where the lead character has this inner conflict of what she doesn't know is that she's trying to come go from being a girl to a woman, right? But she doesn't know that at first. What she is fighting is the resistance to growing up and maturing. And in doing that, when you first meet her, you meet her with her parents and she's asking them for money to pay her rent, right? A very girlish thing a thing that you do when you're struggling, trying to make sense of who you are and what your life is. And if you follow the journey of this lead character throughout the series, you see that she is becoming. So how do you write something like that? What you need to do is first understand who your character is. You have to do a lot of deep work in the in the development of the character, right? So um, she is a woman of a certain age, say 25. She's living in New York. And you begin to excavate some of the things that would allow her to have this journey. And in doing that and building up this particular character, you are able to inform the steps that she will take to become, if you will. So the key to doing something like that is starting with the characters, excavating the characters, understanding her journey or where she will end up and backing your way step by step to that kind of end point, if you will. I think Didi, who I recall from maybe a previous um, session, had a question. How are you? Oh, okay, you got to unmute, unmute please. Unmute, Didi. Hey, how are you? Great. Good. Nice to see you. Yeah, so I don't even think my question is fully baked or formulated. I'm literally just taking notes. A lot of the things that a lot of us are doing, we're reading these books, they're telling us, hey, this is how we can move a story along. These are the important elements. Um, what you helped me to just kind of think about is the fact that I do have um, a character who is having an internal conflict as well as maybe I'll stay with nature. I just mentioned on the last call that I've spent some time in the ocean recently learning how to surf and stuff. 
and I decided I wanted to bring the ocean in as maybe like an antagonist of sorts. You can't conquer the ocean, but it can definitely teach you some things and humble you. <laughs> it could also bring you peace and all these other great things. So I, I decided on that. So I guess what I'm doing right now is just thinking about how do I, without asking, hey, what would you do? But how, um, maybe my goal is to tell the story that is very internal and it's very kind of symbolic in a lot of ways. Okay. And I'm trying not to get stuck in this thing where it's like just thoughts and things. They're actions, they're, they're signs of a symptom of having a psychosis or signs of, you know, actual change happening without adding so much location or so many things that just seem like, um, I don't want to say frivolous, but just not needed. How do you strike a balance between making an internal journey real for people to see, right? Without putting all these extra scenes and all these extra things and all these. I understand what you're saying. I have a couple of yeah. answers for that. Number one, I say, read, read, read. You need to read scripts that have had the same type of uh, elements that you're discussing. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, Big Little Lies is one, because if you place, and this is TV examples. So just let me land this plane. Big Little Lies is one. Uh, Sex in the City is another. New York City is a character in that show. Um, Little Fires Everywhere, I think it's the name of that show with Kerry Washington and Reese mm -hmm. Witherspoon. Fire is one of the things that is a character in that show. So I'm saying read those screenplays and see how those authors nuance this thing. My personal experience, I wrote a screenplay about a woman who lost her husband and the psychosis that she went through to kind of get over that loss while raising a very young child. And that was a personal story. And so what I did was I had to dig into some very unsavory aspects of human nature, which helped me to put that on the page. And when I was being coached, because I think all screenwriters, whether they say this or not, do have a coach who assists them in developing their particular work. One of the things that my coach told me was, make sure that you don't put anything extra on top of what the actual feeling is. What we need to learn how to do is write feeling and not exposition. So in order for me to be able to do that, I had to say to myself, what did it really feel like to find your loved one dead? What did that really feel like? And explore that emotion and then add that to the page versus a whole lot of conversation about, oh, this happened and that happened. And I think I felt like, no, get to the meat of the thing, right? And then- Another thing I would add to that is as you're developing your story, because listen, you're not going to get it right the first time. Writing is rewriting, right? Don't be afraid to edit. Don't be afraid to like, don't be um, precious about what you put on the page. Keep drilling it down till you get to the meat of the thing that you're really trying to say and convey. And that will take time. You're welcome. Javon. You're welcome. You had a question. Yes, thank you. And thank you for everything you've said. It's been so um, helpful. So I want to go back to the conflict when, when in the beginning, when, the, when your main character has to make the decision of how they're going to handle this. And that's where the conflict arises. And I'm trying to figure out the screenplay that I have written. And yes, you're right. The rewrite, the rewrite, the rewrite. And so trying not to get exhausted and discouraged but I am uh, excited about hearing that I think I may need to more clearly answer this question that you just mentioned, whether or not this conflict is with the world, I don't remember the term that you use, or interpersonal. Can you just talk about those two again? Like Yes, I can. And then I want to ask you, well, first, before we I do that, what is your story about? Can you just give me like a high level what your story is, if you don't mind. Uh, it is a high level, and I should have the synopsis memorized, but 
I'm a little bit nervous as well, but it's it's about um, this one particular scientist, and, and that's what my background is in, in medicine. So what this one particular scientist who discovers that there is this um, conspiracy to eradicate certain people off of, at least out of the United States. Okay. Makes this discovery, and he goes on this crusade to try to expose and try to save this, this group of people. So I'm trying to decide as I'm listening to you, is, is it is it him versus the world, or is it just him versus this particular group of people who want to see him and his kind removed? Okay, so that's a great question. So here's what I would say: I think that sometimes we think too big. And we lose the, the heart of where we're trying to go, right? So yes, this is a big world. There is a, a large element of life or death based on science, right? But the story is about a man who is trying to save people, humanity, that kind of thing. And I think that is more of where you should be driving toward versus a larger, the larger picture will be there, right? But what will make us interested is how this person, this antagonist saves the individuals around him or why he has this crusade. What is it that's sparking him to say, okay, I want to save my people. Let's, let's go with him on this journey. You know what I mean? The world will be there. The world is establishing where he's taking this journey if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think the conflict is probably man versus man, not man versus world, okay? Even just hearing you say that right there gave me like a sort of... Yeah, right. And so I'm going to venture to say man sees an issue. The call to action is him deciding to change that issue. He goes on a journey. He fights various obstacles. He gets to a place where he thinks he's won, but oh, he did not win. He did not solve the issue. He has a turn of like a, like, you know, a all is lost moment. And then he comes up with another reason or an action that can get to get him to his final destination. Boom. He takes that action. He gets this high climax. Everything is, you know, where he wants to be. And then there's a calm resolve. Like that's the elements to what you want to do. I just gave you the roadmap. I don't can't say it again. It was a I'm, no, I'm I'm tracking. I'm right. moment. Okay, good, 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 good. Any other questions before no, we keep? Thank you so much. You're welcome. No, okay. Oh yes, yes, Jim. Oh no, sorry, Kwesi. Yes. My cell phone. Here we go. Hey, how's it going? Nice. Hi. Hi. Thank you for oh, coming. Nice yeah, definitely. Um. So my question, just, you know, great nuggets you're putting in. I was just wondering, uh, doing these various presentations, uh, pitching, do you go in with more of a summary? Or, I mean, because you don't have much time, right? So how do you go about in your, your pitching strategy? Uh, and also knowing that you have an opportunity, but you may not have a lot of time to actually develop a whole screenplay at that point, right? Um, what is, what is your strategy with that concern? Great question. So no, I, I, yes, you have a summary because this is your story. You know what it is, right? But I would do what I just did with Javon. I would have my beats in my head, ready to speak and say, so you have about nine beats of a screenplay, the inciting incident, call to action or call to adventure. First act climax, second act climax, uh, all is lost moment, all of those moments, you go through each one of those and you talk through them. You can't say every scene per se, but if you hit every moment, every high climactic moment of your story, that is enough to get your point across. That is enough to sell the idea across. And then once you go through all the beats, you hit your climax, you hit your resolution, you talk about what the hero has learned, right? Because maybe sometimes that's not clear. Listen, we're working with people who may or may not be artistic. Some people who are producers, executives, they want to be the screenwriter. Like, so you got to kind of get them on board with your journey and your reason why you should be telling this particular story. So I would hit the climax, hit all the beats, plus add my summary of my hero is this person, 
this person is this person because of, and this is why I'm telling this story and why you want me to tell this story. That's how I do my pitches. Cool. Good, good. All right. Do we have any other questions on here? Nope. I'm sure I'm sure there will be more um, that will be coming up. It's all good. Um, I keep going. Do you have any thoughts on exposition? Because obviously it's kind of a dirty word, but sometimes you do have stories where you kind of need to get as you need to get information out, especially early so you can move on. Do you have any like thoughts for approaching exposition? Okay. I'm going to say something. I know this is being recorded, but I'm going to say it. Um, exposition is a dirty word. And I have gotten my hand slapped by an executive who has made me a better writer, I will say, because I had too much exposition. This is one of the first jobs I had as a screenwriter for hire for studio, major studio. And I was doing exposition as a shorthand, thinking that it was explaining the things that needed to be explained, but that was not what they wanted to see and I got my hand slapped and it made me a better writer and I'm going to tell you why. When you're working, because I know all of you will be working for a studio one day. I'm claiming it. I know that's going to happen. When you're working for a studio, they work very fast. They don't have time to handhold. If they, if you do get a executive or a producer who handholds you, you're a lucky person because they really want you to succeed. And they probably have a mandate that requires them to get this script done so that they can, you know, go to production, and get paid. But that being said, this particular producer um, handheld me through the process of development. We changed the outline of the screenplay two times so that it could get approved by the network. And then we went to pages and that took about a total of a week and a half. That's how quickly they moved. I initially came up with the idea they hated the idea. I had 24 hours to come up with a new idea. They approved that idea in 24 hours, one week to write an outline, which is not a lot of time, and to go to pages. So exposition can be a thing that can handicap you if you're not a skilled enough craftsman to actually write a story. So I'm going to say no on exposition learn how to really craft your story based on the plot, like really understand what is your character trying to do? Where are we going? Understand the plot points. What's happening? Why are we going on this mission? What is happening in the first act? Why is this second act climax happening this way? Knowing you know, your story from inside and out will assist you in not getting kind of strapped down by too much explanation. If you know who your character is and what the story is, you can hit it and hit it hard. Second thing I want to add to that, I'm a little long-winded with this, but this is very important. Studio executives and even your colleagues who are so gracious to read your scripts, like reading a script for someone is an act of love and an act of service, I must say, especially if it needs work. I'm just being very frank and honest. You want your person to be able to get through the pages by using the white space. Does anybody know what that is? Do you guys know what the white space is? No, okay. When you look at a script, just imagine a script in your mind and you see dialogue or page descriptions or whatever from left to right, the whole block is taken up. That is what's thought of as what not to do. What you wanna do is use your white space lots of dialogue so that you can get through the pages so that the person who's reading can be page turning versus getting stuck on blocks of of text. And that is the thing, back to the exposition, you don't wanna do. You wanna use the white space of dialogue to get through the pages so that they can turn and turn and turn. And that is, a, is a, an example. When you see that, you know, okay, this is a skilled writer. This writer knows what they're doing. They're using the white space to tell the story versus over explaining in block text. I hope that makes sense. Yes, Yaz, I hope I'm saying this right, Yasmin. 
Yeah, that, that's right. Everybody calls me yes, though, so don't feel bad. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, so really, I just have two questions for you. Um, one, um, really about the use of like white space. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel that when I'm writing, uh, sometimes I can be very visual, especially like when I'm setting up a scene. I'm wondering if in those cases where um, the setting is like super important to the plot, mm -hmm. is that an exception of not using as much white space? And um, to tack that on, um, what do you feel is the best balance of, um, I guess, world building while actually like sticking to the plot and not getting too carried away in the world of what's happening okay I love this question because that is me I am the person who's like oh I gotta write oh we over here and it's beautiful and my former writing partner who has since passed away god bless her she would always say oh you got a lot to say Woo! so I'm gonna say find a way to say what you're trying to say in less words I don't think that you should chop your hand off because this is who you are as a writer, right? That is a signature of who you are and I get it. But as I've become a more seasoned writer, I've figured out ways to say it and get out. Say it and get out. Don't, I used to four or five lines of where we at and why we here. No, don't do that, please. You will tip your hand as a non-experienced writer by doing that. I'm going to be honest. I have a lot of showrunner friends, a lot of executive producer friends, a lot of story editor friends. And that is what they say across the board every time. Your second question was... Um, um, how do you find the balance between um, world building? Um, well, oh, like, And that's kind of like a part of that question. Um, how do you find a balance between world building and sticking to the plot and the general concept? I feel like sometimes when I'm writing, like the plot and the concept kind of are like fighting for like space on the page. Sure. Where it's like we want to make sure that if we're like in this sci-fi type of situation, that we're like putting that across um, as blatantly as possible. One, um, I will put it in a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Two, I know you have decks because it sounds like you are a person who, or maybe you don't. I will put it in the deck. Do you know, I will build my deck, create the world, be really clear about that so that the deck is a companion to the script. So they know, okay, this is a sci-fi world. This is where we're going with this. These are the people. This is what you're going to see in this world. And then in the script, yes, you can put in moderation what needs to be said in the, in the scene descriptions. But I would lean into using the dialogue and the conversations that are happening. Not people talking at each other. Oh, did you see so-and-so over there in the... Z95, don't know. Really using the dialogue to create the sense of we are in the dome and this is what's happening. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Making it you. more active versus describing, if that makes sense. Right, right. It's not like Dora and we're saying everything that we're seeing. I, I get there, you. There you go. There you go. That's right. Any other questions? These are great, great questions. Okay. I'm sure we're going to have more coming in, but um, while we have a moment, I know we're, this call has been a lot about the craft, but I know we do have questions about um, the business side of things. So first of all, I would kind of, I think it would be good to, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about how you got started in the industry. Sure. Um, and then if, you know, if you have time, uh, advice for people who are trying to break in um, and, you know, how that might differ. Yeah. Okay, so my background is very interesting. I was, and I still am, I was an actor and dancer on Broadway in New York City. I was working on um, two Broadway shows and we, I had a very good opportunity to be seen um, as an actor and I would get roles and other things that would come across my desk. And I'm grateful for that. But uh, most of those roles were not really something that I could really, number one, sink my teeth into and really something that showed me as an African-American woman. I felt like there were not a lot of opportunities in that space. And so I said, well, you know, I'm going to write. I'm going to write these roles that I feel like I should be playing. And I honed my craft. I did not go to film school, which is very interesting because there's a lot of... Um, you know, various thoughts on that. But what I did do was I found a lot of mentors 
who were professors and adjunct professors and really established writers who mentored me and showed me the craft. So to me, that was my film school. And then eventually I did graduate courses at the School of Visual Arts for television writing. And in doing so, I began to develop uh, my work as a stage play, uh, excuse me, as a uh, playwright, and then into doing more film, feature film, and I happened to connect with a woman who is my mentor. Her name is Ivana Chubbuck in Los Angeles. She is a renowned um, acting coach as well as kind of life coach. She's coached people at the likes of Halle Berry. Um, let's see, Judith Light. She's done a lot of amazing things for a lot of amazing people. Ju Ivana Chubbuck read one of my screenplays and one of her clients, Kat Graham, who was known for Vampire Diaries, she was also known for All Eyes on Me, all kinds of large television um, properties, was looking for a writer to write an option that she had for the Tammy Terrell biopic. And so me and Kat Graham met. She loved the ideas. I pitched her what I thought the story should be. As I talked about earlier, I think this is a story, um, and I identified with Tammy Terrell because she is a woman who overcomes insurmountable odds. If you don't know her story, I highly recommend you look her up. She is a Motown darling. She was the singing partner of Marvin Gaye. I went to school in Philadelphia. She's from Philly. So there was so many synergies that I have with Tammy Terrell, and I got the job. It was my first Hollywood experience meeting someone, the likes of Kat Graham, her hiring me to write this screenplay. And while I was having my baby, my first child giving birth, the announcement of my collaboration came out in the trades and on um, deadline at the same time. So I say that I birthed my baby and this screenplay at the same time. So that's my kind of entree into this arena as a professional screenwriter. Since then, um, talking about writing things that you know, like I said, I was a dancer and I have been dancing since I was four, five years old. I used to dance with Savion Glover. We did tap together. I was a Broadway dancer doing tap. I met so many women through doing the show who were Rockettes. I was also a trainee, a Rockette trainee. One of my very close friends is the first African-American Radio City Music Hall Rockette. I took her story and pitched it. So again, writing what you know, using your relationships to build your kind of repertoire of screenplays is how I began. So bringing that all back, my opportunity with Kat Graham begat my representation, which begat me to get into the rooms with producers and take meetings, which begat me to sell this idea about the first Radio City Music Hall Rockette to Marvista Entertainment, which begat me the next opportunity to sell my uh, Christmas movies to Mar Vista and the own network. So you begin to build relationships. One kind of piggybacks the other. Having a network of people, whether you work with them or not, will come up, it will come back around. My opportunity with Mar Vista and own network came back around four years after my first initial meeting with them. So maintaining relationships is another thing to helping you kind of propel your career. How do you break in? I don't know. There's no answer for that, to be honest. Everyone's road is their road. But what I will say is that you should always be prepared. You should always have your samples ready. Always. Never get caught not knowing what your script is about. So if I ask you for a high level broad thing, you, need, you should be able to give that to me with no problem and know that that person could probably know someone who can get your thing made. So just always staying ready so that you don't have to get ready. One other thing I would suggest that I was shy about doing, but it's actually been a game changer for many of my friends is getting into these television writing programs, film writing programs. So for example, Paramount, WB, uh, let's see, AFI, all of these large kind of, not competitions, but fellowships. These fellowships will launch your career. 
right? You get in one of those, there's mentorships available. They will help you figure out where you are, but you kind of got to know where you are, which goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, know what kind of writer you are. I am a writer who writes stories about women overcoming insurmountable odds. I write films. That's who I am. Get clear about that. Have your materials ready and you definitely will break in. Do we have any other questions? I would encourage people. We don't have a ton of time left. We have about 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, Dee Dee. Hey, so Miriam, all that was super, super insightful. I kind of heard your story before, but I got even more out of it this time. One of those things being, like, first, I just want to ask, are you from Philly or did you just spend some time in Philly? I spent time in Philly, but I'm from New York. I'm from Harlem. Okay. I'm the opposite. So I'm from Philly, but I've lived in Harlem a couple of times. Nice. So, to Temple. Yeah. So that Philly, I love, you know. Temple. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. To you. So, right. Uh, right? <laughs> I was going to ask, now that I'm in LA and I've met even more people since the last time, you know, I was in a meeting with you here um, through Big Apple. So I had a question then and it's kind of like how to leverage these relationships and how to, how to stay in touch. What I've been doing is going to people's stuff, telling people what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Yep. Every once in a while, I'll send a text or something like that. I wanted to get your advice on how to build your network out and how to stay in touch with people, I guess, so that when you are ready to to share or when you, um, I guess, yeah, when you're ready to share, and when you're ready to make an ask, it's not so awkward or weird. Okay. Okay. First, let me ask you, what are you really asking? Are you saying when you're ready to crowdfund? Are you saying when you're ready for people to come and see your film? Like what, what is your thing? You're on um, mute yourself. Sorry. Please. Yeah. So basically I feel like I'm going to need to ask people for help in creating and I think when it's time to pitch, it's going to be favors because I may or may not have an agent by then. And I feel like I've talked to people who have had really good situations where they just know someone. So maybe they were able to attach this person and then they were able to get an agent or a manager kind of after the fact, or maybe that's how they got their agent or manager. Like since I've been out here, I've had like a friend submit me to uh, this commercial acting agent to me I'm like oh thank you that's so nice for you to do but talking to people they're like that's a really big deal if someone refers you to their agent like a lot of people aren't doing that and at least I know the person like it didn't amount to anything but someone watched it nine times right this little right. video and it wasn't me you can see the metrics or whatever so it seems like you need referrals. You need that inside. Okay, so track. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna say what I think you need to hear. Yes. I don't know if this is gonna answer your question. Mm -hmm. You should consider not being caught up in what everyone is doing and referrals and all of that. What you should consider is figuring out what it. It take what is it going to take for you to get done the things you need to get done? And that means, are you going to film something? Are you going to write something? Because no one is going to, particularly in LA, I've been in LA a very long time. Yes. It's going to take a long time for you to ramp up into this system because people have to get to know you. It's like you're starting in the back of the line again. You should start creating for yourself. And so when you talk about help or what you need help with, mm -hmm. I would like for you to get very clear about what you're really asking because you haven't really said what you really need help with. You just said. So one thing, mm -hmm. yeah, one thing is I'm shooting, a, I guess you can call it like a mini docu-series and it's kind of travel-based, but it's the people, not necessarily the places that matter here, okay. but I'm going to a lot of places. So it's interesting in that way. 
So I've been putting together kind of like a crew in each of these places. It's been a bit interesting because yes. everyone's different levels. So I'm trying, what I said, I legit just being transparent here. Like after the last shot I did in Barbados, I almost teared up on the first day because I was just like, wow, we, we didn't get a lot of the shots that I really wanted. I really want to work with people who are higher caliber. And this is a little frustrating because I could have done better, but also I love the people I worked with, but also I want to work with people who are a little more, maybe an yeah, executive right. producer, maybe right. someone who right. is a DP, someone who's done this type of content before. So I think that's my most immediate need. And in LA, I've met people, but are they- Can I- Can I- can I higher caliber people. Quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I would say that you get what you pay for. And I know that sometimes it's hard as young people coming up, but you get what you pay for. I, if I, if it were me, when I used to produce, this is what I would do. If I were you, I would raise the money. However, that, whatever that means to you have a budget and take the people that, you know, can do the job with you to place to place. It'll cost mm -hmm. you less money and less wasting of the resources mm. to do it that way because you don't know what you're going to get in Barbados or wherever you go and I'm yeah, so yeah. that you're passionate about what you're doing you just need to and this is all of us we just got to work smarter I don't want you to work harder you just got to work smarter yeah I love thank that you idea, for that way. it's my pleasure <laughs> it's my pleasure any other questions? I know we're like winding down and I hope you guys don't mind this is being recorded. And I also want to take a picture of my friend. What else? Any other questions? Come on guys, we got time for one or two more. All right, I'll, I'll ask a quick one um, so we can get something on here. Uh, just so, you know, we are 10 minutes out or so, so I do actually just want to take a moment and just let everybody know it is being recorded, this uh, session, and that is going to be getting sent out within the next 48 hours or so. Um, so, yeah, if you have any last-minute questions, please throw those hands up, uh, and we'll try to get those in. Um, I just have a question regarding antagonists. Do you have any thoughts on writing your antagonists, and especially – trying to write we talked a lot about the protagonists and their journeys uh do you have any thoughts on writing the antagonist in relationship to the protagonist and also again we spend a lot of time knowing the protagonists and their backgrounds um, mm -hmm. but does that go the same for the antagonists absolutely great question i love 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 this question so much and i'm gonna tell you why because the protagonist has to be punished by the antagonist to me the way that I write, I will punish them and punish them and punish them some more. And my antagonist, that's their job so that the protagonist can have its journey. You got to, everybody plays a part, right? So bad example. My daughter hates when I make her clean her room. Ooh, she hates it. She's a protagonist and I'm punishing her. Every, clean the room, clean the room. You know, that's, the, you got you to gotta take them to the end. And that is the way that your protagonist will go through the journey. So that is a very important role. And you must know from start to finish, what are they going to do? How are they going to press those buttons every time? Another example, my favorite example that I love to use, the mother in Game of Thrones. She is a terrible antagonist. But when it flips on her is when she has to walk out of the church back to the castle and they're calling shame 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 and she finally gets a dose of all the medicine that she had been delivering to others i think that it's such an important thing to be able to see visually and feel because your screenplays are supposed to make people feel something the reason why tammy terrell although it has not been made yet is my best sample even though I wrote it seven years ago, I still use it as a sample, is because people feel something. People cry every time they turn the page. So both your antagonist and protagonist have to do their job so well that you come away from the screenplay feeling something. You gotta feel something. That is, that is the 
I think one of the things that is least talked about in this industry and is the thing that is most needed. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. And then we have uh, Dravon. And then after her question, if you can just kind of leave us with something that you kind of just, you know, want to end on. So I'll give it over to her. Thank you. I love the fact that you mentioned that you started and you were somewhat um, self-taught. I mean, you've definitely been in the industry, but moving into a writing was sort of how I am. I, I act, and, and, um, but I've not had formal training as a writer. What would you recommend as a resource for novice screenwriters to maybe um, something that I should be reading, something that would, other than screenplays, because I am reading those, but something I should be reading to really get a lot of this technical stuff that you're saying down in me. Yes. Okay. Um, it's very hard for me to recommend stuff because I don't really know where you are as a writer. But what I will say is that what's helped me is not only just reading screenplays, right? But watching some of the things that I know that I want to write. I wanted to write, okay, the color purple, the original made me feel something. I wanted to write like that. Um, uh, uh, Inception made me feel something. I wanted to write like that. What are some of the things that you know that stand out in your mind? Oh, I left the I left the theater and oh, that is what you want to do. It's hard for me to recommend books. I I I, I I'm yeah. sorry that I do, but I think if you find yourself in a space where you can read screenplays that you know on screen make you feel a way. That is the type of writer you want to be and lean into those kinds of that craft, that particular portion of the craft. Okay. The Writers Guild of um, the Writers Guild West, I believe, still does. I don't know if they do it online. Some of you guys are not in L.A. This one is the Los Angeles location. They may do it in the East Coast, too. I'm not sure. But they have uh, office hours where you can go in register and then they will allow you to go in and read screenplays you can't take them out but you could go in stay there all day read what you want make your notes i recommend you do that it's free and it's available and you don't have to be a member of the guild to do that read i, I think the most important thing other than writing a writer writes you got to write every day so this is my kind of takeaway writers write you got to write every day you got to write like your life depends on it. You got to write to tell a story that no one else gets to tell. You got to write because the muse is channeling through you because you have a duty to tell your story. And no one on this call or outside of this call has the right to hold back their gifts. Your gift is to write and to tell the story. So do yourself a favor and always, always tell the story to your best ability and to the most authentic self that you can possibly be. That is my end note. Um, please stay in touch. As Didi knows, some of you know, I do teach screenwriting for beginners. You can contact me directly. I don't know if you guys have that email directly, but I can always drop it in the chat. And I am so grateful for you all for being here and taking the time to be with me today. If, yeah, if you could drop that in the chat, uh, that would be spectacular. And I'll give uh, everyone a chance to kind of take that down really quick. Um, but Miriam, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, this is, I've done, I've done quite a few of these. And I think this is one of the most informative um, and effective that I think I have had the privilege of being on. Um, so yeah, again, everybody, uh, so this is going to be sent out, the recording of this is going to be sent out um, within the next 48 hours or so. Um, if you have... Uh, you know, you should share these uh, with your friends um, to try to get more people on these calls. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, have a great day. Thanks, guys.